I want people to think of languages as unique repositories of aggregated information that have resulted from thousands of years and at least hundreds of years of individual experiences of particular languages. In other words, each language is unique and we have to understand it in its uniqueness before we can make any sense of talking about its similarities to other languages. So bringing a theory to languages that says they're all alike in aspect A is to me the least helpful way of doing research. First I discover it, I, I, I describe it, and then I see if there's any similarities that, that really make a lot of sense to me. Welcome to The Story of Language, an original podcast series about language, linguistics, cognition, and culture. My name is Christian Saunders and I am an English teacher, and throughout this series I will be in discussion with Dan Everett, linguist, anthropologist, philosopher, and author. In this episode we talk about the Pidaha language and what it tells us about the intersection of language and culture. We also talk about the practice of the science of linguistics animal versus human communication, universal translation, and what unites and what divides us as humans. If you would like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter at Story of Language, or you can send us an email at storyoflanguage at gmail.com. This is episode two of The Story of Language. I actually wanted to start today by talking about something that we never talked about explicitly in, in, in the first episode, which was that even though you, you went to the Pidaha as, as a missionary to convert them to Christianity, in fact, the opposite happened. And, you know, they converted you to become an atheist. And what, one of the reasons for that is, is the, is the Pidaha culture. And so I thought we could um, we could talk a little bit about some things that are kind of special about about Pidaha culture. Sure, I still get emails uh, regularly. In fact, I just got one uh, day before yesterday from missionaries and Christian pastors and others who are trying to reconvert me, and uh, and don't believe that I had good reasons to abandon the faith. So happy to talk about those things. Well, it's funny because um, because for me, I was I was born as an atheist. Well, my parents were... were... Well, we all are born as atheists. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, what I mean is from birth, I, I've been an atheist. And, and I've always thought, I don't get the big deal about people who, who, who kind of abandon their faith. I don't get the big deal. Like, it seems, because it, from my point of view, it seems obvious to not believe. But, but then when I was reading your book, it made me realize that, that actually... It would be the equivalent of me starting to believe, which is something that I cannot imagine happening. Right. If you came out to your family as an evangelical Christian and you started trying to convert all of them, it would be a similar effect. I mean, uh, somebody asked the philosopher John Searle at a lecture uh, that he was giving many years ago, um, are you an atheist? He said, well, he said, you know, there are a lot of things I don't believe in, and uh, Santa Claus is one, but we don't have any special name for that. <laughs> and so, so he said, you know, I prefer not to say that uh, word because I just, just one of the many things I don't believe in, and I don't label myself for everything I don't believe in. But, you know, for me at the time, it was like uh, the closest I can imagine, although I haven't lived through this, is, is, is a gay person coming out to their family as gay. There's, if, if you're in a Christian community, uh, especially if you're a missionary making your living from that community, uh, coming out as an atheist means, A, you've lost your job, uh, and you've lost all your income, and you probably have lost all your friends. So we had hundreds of people who were supporting us uh, monthly so that we could stay in the jungle and do this work. And when I came out as an atheist, not only did I have severe family problems that are... Uh, with my children are resolved now, but, uh, but none of those people talk to me anymore. 
Uh, they, they have nothing to do with me because I was like um, the cream of the crop. A missionary is the cream of the crop when it comes to Christianity. I mean, they're the ones who are really out there living the faith. And then for one of them to say, uh, yeah, I, I don't believe this anymore. That's just um, a devastating blow to the idea that uh, once you have received the gift of faith, that's the way it's talked about, um, that will never go away. So, so for many of them, I was never a Christian. I was always a hypocrite because they cannot believe that somebody who was a Christian no longer is. So, so what, what specifically were, were some of the elements about the Peter Ha culture that, that, that kind of led you to, to abandon your faith? First of all, they're, they're an incredibly attractive people. Um, you don't see that, obviously. I, I mean, when you first get there, um, your impression will be it's a group of people on a camp out. They don't seem to have much formal um, culture in the way that we expect. There was no painting. There were no feathers. There were uh, no body painting. Um, so, so all the things that you, you hear of or think of when you see of other Amazonian groups, beautiful headdresses and this, you don't see with the Pinaha. They, you know, they're lying around talking and laughing or they're out fishing or running in the jungle. But as you get to know them and you see the, the kindness that is so common there, the, the, uh, they are the antithesis of a violent group. I mean, they kill for a living, right? Because they're hunters and gatherers. So they do kill animals and they know how to kill. But their overall value structure places peacefulness and kindness very high. So that, that already produces a conflict. How are these people so cool, so good, living by such obviously uh, what I would have said Christian virtues uh, without any concept of Christianity? Okay, so, so then you start to think, well, my message may not be wrong, but it does seem to be a little bit superfluous. But, but then as you look at their desire for evidence, uh, if somebody's talking to you, there's a suffix, you know, there's a series of suffixes that go at the end of the verb that tell you whether the information was directly observed, deduced, or you heard it from someone else. And so when you're talking about something, they want to know what your evidence is. It's a very important part of their culture. So you're talking about Jesus, and they'll say, uh, Dan, was he... Uh, was he brown like us or was he white like you? Um, they don't have color words, but they describe it. Was his skin like ours or was his skin like yours? And, and, and you say, well, I didn't see him, but some people say he was brown and some people say he was white. And they said, oh, you didn't see him, but your father saw him. No, my father didn't see him. Who, who do you know that saw him? Well, I don't know anybody who actually saw Jesus. And they said, so why are you telling us about him? And it, it violated it violated the whole, uh, the language and the culture. It violated the language because you can't put a suffix on there except hearsay. You can say, I got it from hearsay. But, it, but that hearsay is supposed to be from somebody alive. It can't be from somebody dead, right? How can you hear it from somebody dead? Um, so it just didn't make any sense to them ling uh, linguistically or culturally. Um, that especially that I would tell them that this guy was somebody important to follow when I had never seen him and really had no firsthand knowledge of him whatsoever. So these were, these were strong challenges to get me to think. They had the virtues. I thought, you know, the only thing they didn't have was the security of heaven and hell, but then it turns out they don't believe in God. They have no concept of heaven, no concept of hell, um, and they're not afraid of death. You can't make them afraid of death because – Nobody's wanting to die right now, but death just happens. And they had a much more healthy attitude towards death. Yeah. In, in the book, there's some stories about death and they kind of view death as this, well, it's an, an almost inevitable. And if it's going to happen, it's going to happen almost like a kind of fatalistic viewpoint of, of death. Yeah. I mean, it's not fatalistic in any sort of religious sense. It is, it is, um, it's empirical. We know of nobody who has lived forever. We don't know of any animal that has lived forever. We have no evidence for anything after that happens. So that must be what happens. I mean, it's, it's pure induction. You know, they're, they're very reasonable people in that sense. So they're not um, fatalistic. You know, if a guy uh, risks his life for his family, he doesn't believe that if he's killed, he's going to go to the afterlife and watch them happily and they can feel his presence and all those kind of superstitions. He knows if something happens to him, he's dead like an any other animal is dead. His body's 
going to lie on the ground and rot unless somebody sticks it in a hole. And, and that's just the way it is, you know, but the, why would you cry about it? You don't see dogs sitting around crying about their death uh, that's coming. Um, so, so it's not, I wouldn't call it fatalism. I'd call it just living with the truth that you see. I think that a lot of people would have a lot of difficulty um, not only understanding that point of view, but especially living by the, that that kind of principle it would be impossible for most people. You know, they they would that they would say to you, "Well, what's the point? Where's where's the hope? You know, if I'm just an animal." Yeah, well, Freddie Mercury put out a song, "Who Wants to Live Forever," and uh, the answer is just about everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but but we're not going to, and and. Um, you know, according to the Peter Ha, and according to me now, I don't think everybody's going to live forever, but we all want to think that somehow, like I write a book, a lot of authors would like to think that that book is going to, maybe nobody likes it today, maybe it doesn't sell well, but maybe in a hundred years it will, and then everybody's going to discover my genius. I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'm not going to be alive then. I couldn't give a rip what they do with my books in a hundred, two hundred years. You know, if, if they if they were to start selling and I had a great, great, great grandchild that made some money, okay, fine. But they'll be out of copyright by then anyway. So so I write them and I do the work that I do for the satisfaction that it gives me in my life to figure things out and to uh, express those things for myself and for others. And if people like them, I'm extremely happy if they find them beneficial, that's good. But I don't do them for posterity in some abstract sense because that's just the atheist way of living forever. It, it seems that you, you, you have definitely, you've gone to the polar extreme of, of, of faith. This is an, an effect of, of living with the Peter Haas for so many years, right? This way of thinking? I, I, I believe that my thinking has been profoundly affected by them in ways that I haven't even discovered yet. Um, and, and I admire them tremendously. Uh, when we talk about life and, and death, you know, in the evening sometimes they will call me outside to sit on a log. And in the Amazon, you can see on a clear night the stars so clearly. And they'll point out satellites. And one time they pointed out something that I realized later was the space station. And they ask me about this. And they say, you know, who put that up there? I say, well, I, I don't know. I think that was probably the Americans who put that up there because I'm not actually sure what it is, you know. But they had the idea that Japanese built all electronic stuff because everything I had had been built by the Japanese. So uh, they were surprised to hear that the Americans could build anything. Because <laughs> <laughs> you said you were pretty useless at building things. Yeah, yeah. They know I can't do anything. And this guy named Japan, he builds them. <laughs> <laughs> so Americans are weird to them. They don't understand how they get food because I don't hunt and I don't know how to hunt and I'm a terrible fisherman. All the skills they value, I lack. Um, but they, they accept me and they accept me very well. And, you know, a uh, Brazilian asked them one time in broken in this, the vestiges of this trade language that still exists around there that they speak a little bit of. Um, how did Dan learn Pitaha? Because I've come up here for years and I can't speak any Pitaha. And they said, he sits on his butt all day looking at paper, and then he stands up and he starts talking to us in our language. <laughs> it's totally mysterious. <laughs> well, well, this sort of brings me back to something that, that you said a little bit earlier. You said that, you know, they don't have any kind of creation myth. They don't believe in, in any kind of, you know, gods or, or anything. And my, my, initial, my initial thought as to maybe the reason why would be, well, because they don't have a writing system. They don't write anything down. So there's no way for these kind of stories to, to pass from one generation to another. But that's not true because there are plenty of languages that have never been written down that have really um, deep and um, detailed creation myths. Exactly. I mean, um, you know, the Pitaha are one of thousands of languages that don't have a writing system. Um, but they're the only one known that doesn't have a belief in, this, in the supernatural in some way or God or something like this, which teaches us a great deal about the human experience. And, you know, so, for example, Freud was wrong. Um, and, and a lot of people have been wrong. Joseph Campbell, who wrote all this uh, stuff about the, you know, the universality of myths, this is wrong. Uh, myths are not universal. Religion is not universal. Um, and so one of the great things that Pinaha shows us, not only about language, but about culture, is that 
our ideas of what is universal and what makes us human are, are based on a very small sample. And we have to sample more. Mm, I mean, but could could you not just say, well, if there's 6,000 languages in the world and only one of them violates some of these principles, well, we can just sort of ignore that and pretend it doesn't exist. And, you know, the theory is still good. Yeah, it depends. So if you take swans, if you say most swans are white and you find a black swan, well, no big deal, because I didn't say they all were. I said most were. But if I say all swans are white and I find a black one, well, I'm wrong. Um, and so if you claim that all language, all peoples have religion, uh, Peter Hush shows you wrong. You can't set that aside. In fact, in my book, Dark Matter of the Mind, I have a, a long discussion on what's the difference between a counterexample and an exception. And uh, that really has to do with the culture of the person seeing the data. So if the cost of accepting this as a counterexample is too great, you're going to say it's an exception. Um, and, and if your theory um, is being built and you don't have a great commitment to whether this happens or not, well, you're going to just build it into your theory. So now your theory predicts that there are some languages uh, that don't have uh, words for God. Um, so, so much of what we consider to be a counterexample or an exception has to do with the the commitments we've made, our theoretical commitments, our personal commitments to what the world is like. Um, just as there were many people who, you know, if you can sell around the world, it's not flat. But there would have been all kinds of reasons why people would have said, well, you didn't actually sell around the world. You know, you, you, you skirted the edges of it. It gave you the sensation of, you know, there, there are many, there are all kinds of explanations. So people uh, tend to put anomalous facts down as exceptions rather than counterexamples because they don't want to have to redo their career. And th this is something which I have always admired about uh, science as a field in general. You know, people can dedicate their whole lives, you know, they can dedicate 50 years to researching something. And then in the end, they're like, well, I was wrong. You know, people are still human, right? And there's still people who even though they've been proved wrong and they know they're wrong, like they, they're not going to throw away their whole career, right? So they fight against these kind of ghosts. There, there, are two, there, are two, there are a couple of different perspectives on that. First of all, I'd like to meet the scientist who says, oh, well, I was wrong. I haven't met one of those guys yet um, <laughs> or those women. The ones I have found who are willing to admit they're wrong is in a minor point that they had no major commitment on. But in terms of their, their entire theory, you know, like you find a... Uh, a string theorist in physics who realizes that string theory doesn't work. You know, th those, that's hard to, hard to find. There probably are some, but how clever are you in defending your theory? If you abandon your theory at the first sign uh, of bad weather, um, you may be doing science a disservice because maybe this exception or this counterexample can lead to a reformulation of the theory that actually makes it stronger. So very often, the most famous scientists are those who have taken an apparent theory-crushing counterexample and shown how it can be built into the theory and make the theory even stronger. Oh, actually, the theory does predict this. Um, in the Peter Ha case, um, I think that part of the reason that, that people have been so upset with me is that I used to do that theory. I mean, I, I was a practicing card-carrying Chomsky and syntactician and phonologist and universal grammarian for decades, and then I realized it doesn't fit. So when I wrote the papers, I wrote, I wrote them, the original papers, as an insider, showing that there's no way that these are not counterexamples. And that's where most of the objections come from. And it's interesting, the parallels, maybe, between your experience of... of well, should we say leaving religion and then also leaving this kind of mainstream linguistics, there's kind of like you, maybe you lose all your friends, you know, you kind of uh, maybe lose your job. Well, there, there is all of that. You know, I, as I stop and think about it, I've never been a good joiner or belonger. Um, I um, have always been somewhat contrarian in my views. I think that one of the reasons I became a Christian was because everybody I knew was an atheist. Uh, <laughs> and I was raised as an, an atheist, and I was 
you know, in, into drugs at that time, nothing really serious. I, I don't want to give, I, although my family got into drugs, you know, my sister died of AIDS and my cousin was in prison in Texas for a long time. So I had all this going on around me. And then I met this family of missionaries who had this really cool life and they were going back to the jungle. And that just sounded so cool. So what better way I was a hippie, so what better way to rebel against North American materialist society than to say, you know, you chuck it all in and head off for the jungles of South America? So, and that involved religion. So I, so that I did that, and then after I'd been with um, missionaries and Christians, this is the other part of other side of the coin. I didn't find the arguments for God or the lives that I saw being led by Christians to be all that great. Um, you know, if I started comparing the lives of Christians with some of the Pitaha or even some of my Brazilian colleagues at the University of Campinas, you know, these guys were drinkers and partiers, but they were wonderful, cool people, too. So I really, I really liked them. There was a lot to be said for drinking and partying, I thought, uh, not on a, you know, not as a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week activity, but uh, on the occasional uh, letting things down. So th there was all of this that made me realize that... Um, uh, you know, I don't want to be, I just don't want to be seen as a group like this. I, I want to be judged for who I am and not for the group that I belong to. So, you know, I'm not an evangelist for atheism these days. I wasn't evangelist long enough. I'm happy to tell people about my atheism. But on the other hand, um, I am not interested in trying to convert people from religion to atheism. I mean, it, we have enough things to talk about and and cope with in this world, and almost all of us have mutually inconsistent beliefs of one form or another, so not my business to correct people. I, I, don't think, I don't think I've ever met anybody who's actually joined a religion as a form of rebellion. Normally it's the other way around, right? So it's very unique, I think. I, I will say one thing about religion is it got me um, to become a serious student. It got me out of, um, of drugs altogether, marijuana and LSD. And, and it got me interested in ideas because my former father-in-law, uh, we would sit up till three in the morning talking about theology and the Bible. And although I don't think those these days are things I want to spend a lot of time talking about, they are concepts and they are ideas and they, they do require thinking. And so this began to get me um, talking about ideas for the first time in my life. So it was all important stuff to me. And I, I'm glad I, I went through this period of my life. And uh, uh, I met a lot of fine people who just don't care for me anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so so let, let's talk a little bit more about some um, some of the stranger or maybe yeah, more unusual aspects of of the of the Peter Ham culture. And, and one of those that that I remember distinctly from the book is that if if they um, wake up and they go fishing at four o'clock in the morning, then when they come back with the fish, they'll just eat the fish at four o'clock in the morning. Yes. Yeah. I mean, there's no refrigerator. You don't salt the food. I mean, you eat the food, you know, you, you, you get up, you go get the food. I remember one time I was out there by myself and it was like one o'clock in the morning and I slept in a, in a bed at that time with a mosquito net closed by Velcro. And, and I suddenly, I start to hear the Velcro rip and it's pitch black, and I feel around for my flashlight because I have no idea what's happening, and I shine my flashlight, and, and my just awakening eyes, I see these two glowing things coming towards me, and it like scared, scared me, and, and then I realized there are two big fish on a paddle, and I shine the, uh, I shine the light up farther, and there's, there's this friend of mine, he's dead with a big grin on his face, huh? <laughs> Let's eat. <laughs> let's That's eat. what he said. Let's eat. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm not getting up right now. I don't care. I don't want to eat a fish right now at 30 in the morning. And he just couldn't understand why anybody would turn down a fresh fish, you know, um, especially if he knew I was eating canned meat, which – that's not as good as a fresh fish. Yeah, so so when they have food, they eat it. And when they feel like doing something, they do. I mean, they don't have to punch a clock at 8 in the morning. You know, if they get back at 4 and finish eating at 7 or talking and laughing, they go to sleep again at 10 and sleep till 2 or or noon and just take right off again. Yeah, and so you said that there can be people... Well, people are basically sort of, someone is awake 24 hours a day. Like people can be singing at three o'clock in the morning or just there's no timetable of any sort. When I was thinking of possible 
titles for a book about the Pinaha many years ago, I thought of the noisemakers because there's just always noise coming from the village. You think of these, in fact, when you go hunting with guys, you think, okay, they're hunting. They're going to be really quiet and, and they're just making noise and lapping their heads off the whole way and screaming and yelling and, and telling uh, dirty jokes and stuff. It's only when they get where they, because they know the jungle so well. So when they know that the animal is close by, they're all quiet. And they'll tell me, you stay here, you make too much noise. And I haven't said a word, I'm just walking. <laughs> <laughs> and I walk too loud. And, and if you do start to stroll through the village at night, assuming the dogs don't attack you immediately, because everybody has like 15 little dogs and they're vicious, um, somebody will say, you know, I, I've thought that I was all by myself at times and, and uh, just in the pitch black, I feel a hand come on my shoulder. Hey, what you doing up? <laughs> so it's like it's like they're you know somebody's on guard duty all the time uh, wow you can never surprise them in the village wow and 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 the name of the book your book in the end was don't sleep there are snakes and and that's actually you explain that that's like something that they would say before they go to bed it's like a little refrain because one of the aspects of peter Han culture is that they value toughness exactly exactly you they don't overeat like if they eat a huge amount because they've got some, you know, they've killed a lot of game, then they're going to go a couple of days. One of the great benefits of eating a lot is you don't have to eat again the next day. Uh, so it's not like they're going to keep eating every day the same amount. Um, so, so there, it's you know, it is a feast or or, or famine kind of thing. But uh, um, being hard and not oversleeping and and not being afraid of work and showing your strength at paddling your canoe or running through the jungle or carrying heavy loads um, and not showing pain. These are all values with them because it shows that you've mastered your body and you've mastered your life. What's, what's really interesting that, that all of the, well, the, the sort of the, the, the intersection between the culture and the language is something that you sort of struggle to understand at first, but then you, you have, coined as the immediacy of experience principle. So could you sort of explain what that is? Yes, and, and how I came about that idea. There, there, obviously a long story behind the whole thing. So I went there trained as a, as a linguist that didn't believe there was any particular connection between language form. You know, how could, how could 65,000 verb forms have anything to do with the culture in which this verb is uttered? Um, and, and, um, and I, had, I had learned to believe all these things that people had. You know, they had grammars of a certain type. They had numbers. They had kinship systems of a certain level of complexity. Uh, they had color words. They had belief in God. They had all of these things. And I found none of this stuff among the Pinaha. And I began to realize um, during the, uh, the, uh, a year at, at the Mass, at, not at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, I was there for a year too, but many years later at the Max Planck Institute for uh, evolutionary anthropology, um, which is a, a wonderful place to work. I was I was up late at night. I think it was actually about three in the morning, um, and I was just thinking and thinking about all these weird things, which were not weird to the Peter Ha, but were weird to most theoreticians. And I said, okay, so if they have kinships, a kinship system, it's only my generation, generation above, and generation below. These are the kinships terms. That they, that they encounter in their life. These are the relationships that one life encounters. Uh, numbers require generalizing. You know, so one bird, is that the same, you know, like four birds, is that the same as four oranges? Actually, you've got to come up with this abstraction of a quantity that generalizes beyond my experience in this sense to apply to things I haven't experienced yet. And colors. Um, uh, a, a red uh, red hair is not the same as a tomato. It's not the same red, you know. So all, to generalize and call all of these things red is is to ignore their particularity, their, their peculiarities, their their uh, what the philosopher David Hume called their haxicities, uh, you know, the the things that make them what they are. Um, so um, and then the, the the fact that they don't uh, they don't have clauses that are really complex that um, each each particular utterance of the pitaha has to have this suffix for the verb 
that affects only that verb and its noun phrases that are associated uh, with what, where I got the evidence. So all of these things come together to say that, um, and also there's a verb in Pitaha that means in or out of experience, which is a kind of interesting verb. And so thinking about all these things, I realized how important experience is for them. And I was looking, uh, maybe because I'm a Western trained scientist, for a unifying kind of concept or value in the culture that could explain all of these things. The kinship system, the language, the colors, the lack of numbers. And I came, I said, okay, so what's important to them is the immediacy of their own experience. Talking about things they've experienced. It's not that they don't know there's a past. I've been interpreted as saying they, you know, they don't have a concept of the past. So they do have a concept of the past and they have a concept of the future. But those things which are out of my experience are out of my control. And they actually have verb suffixes that talk about in control, out of control, which you don't have in English or Spanish. So um, I came up with this principle, and it seemed to account for all these other things they had. It made sense. And it actually made predictions I wasn't even aware of. So they don't have quantifier words like all, each, which also require the violation of media experience, right? Because all... Um, and each and every are generalizations that apply just like numbers and color words to a bunch of things. So each uh, grain of sand, each, each bird, these things require counting and they're abstract concepts actually. So, but at the same time, they do have nouns like dogs and birds, sort of general generic terms. And, and I didn't, I thought, well, what's the difference between birds and all birds, you know, um, and uh, it turns out that there is quite a difference and there are books written on it by semanticists, which I discovered after I had already published this. So for some people, it was great to see this distinction because they've all, always been arguing for this. So um, making this proposal, uh, it wasn't an attack on anyone's particular theory. If, if somebody were to go back and read my 2005 article in current anthropology, I simply say that languages are unique combinations of culture, uh, values, social roles, knowledge structures, and language that work together to produce uh, a unique way of thinking and talking about the world. Um, and that for linguists, the lesson is we can't simply assume that everything is alike. Even when we take a sentence out of a particular language, what I call the smorgasbord approach to linguistic research, uh, we can't assume that that sentence means the same in this language as it means in my language, even though the literal meaning is the same. Um, we can't assume that brown, for example, means the same thing in Spanish. Or, you know, like you can say, you can translate brown from English to Portuguese, mahon, um, but does it actually mean the same to a Portuguese speaker? Because, and it doesn't. You can show this by showing that it never completely refers to exactly the same things in each of those languages. So, uh, so, th so what I was then trying to do was show how the differences among the languages of the world may actually be more important than their similarities in showing us about the limits of the human experience and what it means to be human. It's really interesting because even even if you look at just one part of that, which is, for example, color, you know, the kind of the, the universe, the universality of color and color, color words and how we perceive color. I mean, that in itself has been like a, a 100 year debate in, in the world of linguistics. So so you have um, you have the classic article uh, from the 60s by Brent Berlin and Paul Kay. Um, both of whom commented extensively on my original article and who I have, you know, been to dinner with both of them and they're great guys. And they wrote this article on the universality of color terms and they made predictions. If you have colors, you're going to have a system like this or like this or like this, but they're all going to draw from the same. And the universal basis of colors, actually there's a compelling evidence that there is a universal basis for colors and it's just the way our eyes are constructed by evolution by the evolution of our species. Um, so there definitely is a universality in the way that we perceive colors physically. Um, but the big distinction is how do we discuss them? How do we talk about them um, within a particular culture? Um, 
it, it does turn out, and I think they're right when they say that a lot of the colors of the world, uh, the systems that we find, are based on different arrangements of how we perceive things. I mean, they, they originally, they all trace back to that physical uh, fact about human color perception. Uh, but, but I don't think that everybody does use the word brown in the same way. Everybody, not everybody uses yellow in the same way. And the Peter Ha certainly don't. Um, this doesn't mean that Brent and Paul are wrong. It just means that that's not the whole story. And that if we think it is the whole story, you know, we're always looking to reduce the complexity of the world around us by generalizations. And once we've done that, we've got little bins that we can throw our facts into. And we can say, okay, this, is, this, is, this was solved in this paper in 1968. This is what I can solve right now so that people in the future don't have to think about this anymore. And my answer is, yeah, there's always interesting things to say about stuff, but no problem is ever fully solved in that sense. Except, as Charles Peirce would say, at the end of time. He said, truth is what serious people um, working until the end of time would eventually agree about. Or, truth is the mule kicked me and it hurts. I don't need a lot of people working on that till the end of time. So my personal experience is I, I have a pretty good reason to, to tell you what I'm feeling. But, but for other things like what does, what does color mean, what does culture mean, what is language, these are not things we're going to find the answer for in a single or multiple lifetimes. Yeah, I, I, there's a lot of things that I admire the ancient Greeks for. Um, and, and, you know, one of them was, was the way that they... Um, that they used the the dialectic to to sort of create this system of logic that says, well, you know, we don't really have answers to truth. We try to find truth, but it's really an ongoing process. It's it's not a destination. It's a process. Right, and this is very similar to what American philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce would have said. I mean, William James, who was sort of Peirce's protege. A lot of people would be upset to hear that because James is considered one of the greatest American philosophers. But in many ways, he made his living misinterpreting Peirce. Uh, <laughs> but um, so James heard Peirce talk about truth and, and James then says, there is no truth. It's whatever is useful to me. And Peirce wrote him and said, that's really, that's really stupid. You know, I mean, it's not a matter of what's useful to me. It's just that I can't find it necessarily by myself, but it's out there. But it takes us a long time. And, and so whatever I call truth today may need to be revised tomorrow. And the very fact that it has to be revised means it wasn't truth today. And as long as we have to keep revising our statements, we're still approaching the truth and we haven't gotten there. But that's not to say it doesn't exist. So Peirce would have agreed with the ancient Greeks, but he's unfortunately associated in many people's minds with William James's concept of truth which is that it really doesn't exist, although some James contradicts himself in different ways, uh, which just shows that he lives by that principle. So he would have been a great politician. Truth is what I want it to be. If he had the personality for it, uh, you know, he was a fairly uh, sickly uh, personality. I admire uh, James tremendously, but, uh, but, but he would have been, he was a much better politician, which is why he had a great job and Peirce died in poverty. Peirce was just a curmudgeon and uh, had no problem telling really smart people that they were stupid uh, <laughs> because compared to him, they were. Uh, and, uh, you know, so, so working on his life is a very humbling experience because you realize, oh, yeah, he's a lot smarter than I am. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like to think that there are such people, but in fact, you know, <laughs> this guy really, really was a lot smarter than me. No, we all, um, we all like to think we are uh, special, right? And this is actually something which I know a lot of people find very hard to accept about language. You know, we like to think that humans are really special in having language. And, you know, in some ways it's true, but really we're just animals and, and animals also communicate. Yeah, exactly. Every species communicates. I mean, you, I, in fact, according to Peirce, there's nothing in the universe that doesn't communicate. Um, that, you know, um, the seasons are communication among the environment, you know, with the environment, you know, the, with, it's a sort of the sun goes, the earth goes around the sun and that leads 
to a communication with the atmosphere that, that causes the seasons. Um, trees communicate with the length of the daylight so that we're seeing that all of the trees in Massachusetts right now are getting very beautiful and soon they're going to be naked again and it's going to be in winter and we will hate our, hate our lives for about eight weeks and then we'll come back out into spring and fall on our, our knees to worship Mother Earth. Um, but, um, but so communication is common among animals and what makes it different among humans may not be that spectacularly different from communication among animals. I think it is very different, but I don't think it's different in kind. It's different in quality. I mean, my dog is really smart, but I got to tell you that when it comes to the things that are important to me, I'm smarter. Uh, she, she is smarter when it comes to figuring out what's in the forest around us. Okay. So in that sense, she's able to gather information that I can't gather from the environment and make judgments that I'm unable to make and make them fast. Um, but about a lot of other things, most other things, I'm smarter. Uh, and, and so he, humans tend to be the, we are the smartest animals. Um, and, and we might as well be proud of that fact because that's what we evolved for. And so it, it's not surprising that our communication system is better for us. But the fact that there's ambiguity and vagueness, which are useful um, at times, um, you know, my wife and I, uh, like everybody's spouses, everybody's friends, we have arguments based on misunderstandings. And if language were perfect, uh, there wouldn't be any misunderstandings. But it's not perfect, which is why there's nothing but misunderstandings most of the time. It evolved. It's a sort of make-do uh, fix to the, the process of building communities. And um, we shouldn't get too much, we shouldn't get too proud of the fact that we can communicate better than uh, animals in some respects. I mean, ants can probably communicate far more effectively about the location of food sources than humans can. It's, it's interesting um, that it's taken so long, and I feel like there's a movement in, in the field of linguistics towards this, this idea, you know, but it's incredible that it's taken so long to appreciate the, the importance of culture in language. And, and in fact, maybe it's not that it's taken so long, maybe it's just that people, that we knew that, and then we kind of forgot it because we got so caught up in the the mathematics of, of language, and, and now we're remembering it again, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's a fair assessment of the history. Um, when, you know, when Charles Peirce was writing philosophy and writing about the theory of signs, which was this kind of theory of linguistics, uh, culture was an implicit part of that, a very important, uh, although implicit part of that. When Franz Boas came along and his students, Edward Sapir and Margaret Mead and, and, and others, Alfred Kroeber, um, uh, began to work, um, they all saw culture as vitally interconnected with language. Language could affect culture and culture could affect language. It was only in the late 40s um, with the mathematical work of Zelig Harris that, uh, I mean, well, I shouldn't say only, but that was, that was the first and major sign. Zelig Harris developed a theory of, of language that was quite mathematical. He still didn't totally deny culture, but but it was, he had a very interesting mathematical uh, analysis of how language worked. Um, and his student was Noam Chomsky, his PhD, his, both his, his BA, his MA, and his PhD student. Chomsky did all those degrees with Harris and was profoundly influenced by Harris. Uh, Chomsky then went off to Harvard as a junior fellow, which is quite an honor. Um, they, they still give those junior fellowships out today, which is basically have four years to do whatever you want to do. Uh, and he hung out with a lot of mathematicians and he read a lot of interesting mathematical work and com computer science. And he said, oh, language isn't related to culture. Language is a computational system for the expression of thought. Not a bad idea. Um, Freud had a lot of good ideas. They all turned out to be wrong. Uh, but, but this was the idea. And for the last 60 years, it has prevented most linguists from looking carefully at what Boaz and his successors knew which is that you can't understand language or how it works or its mechanics or even its syntax without understanding the culture in which it's found. If you take the Pinaha 65,000 possible verb forms, most of the suffixes are not things we use in English. They all have to do with culturally significant Pinaha concepts. 
So the verb itself in Pinaha is just a product of Pinaha culture. It is limited by the constraints on the human brain, and some of those constraints are computational. Um, it's also the fact that certain ways of organizing information are more, um, uh, are more efficient, um, whether it's uh, humans or other animals. And so it's not surprising that you find that hierarchical organization of information is found throughout the animal kingdom. In fact, you find it in the, in the mineral kingdom. You find galaxies organized hierarchically. At least that's how they appear to our hierarchy looking for brains. Um, so um, I think there's been a long hiatus in, in the traditional way of looking at language. And I hope that we're coming back to that now. You find this entire movement in linguistics called functionalism, which is a step in the right direction, although they still don't take culture seriously. About the only place you still find it are in traditional anthropology departments that believe that anthropology has four disciplines, archaeology, cultural anthropology, physical anthropology, and linguistics. And a linguist in such a department called an anthropological linguist or a linguistic anthropologist. Um, my son and I joke that we have nothing in common. He's an anthropological linguist and I'm a linguistic anthropologist. <laughs> so so um, could, could we talk specifically about some ways in which um, the Peter Hahn culture has affected the Peter Hahn language? And so I know that one of them is, is that because of their immediacy of experience principle, because of because they only believe in and and kind of care about things which they directly experience, they have these verb um, suffixes that to indicate that, right? Yes. Yeah, so, so the first place we see it, if we if well, we see it in many places. We see it in the words, the lack of numbers, the lack of quantifiers. We see it in parts of words. These evidence, um, evidential. They're found in other languages too, and they're called evidentials. Um, they don't play the same role in these other languages that they play in Pitaha, which I, I have another problem I have is using the same term to describe similar things across languages. I think that leads to a false sense of identity. It, it also affects the grammar, the syntax itself. You know, as I discuss in detail in that 2005 paper, the absence of recursion in Pitaha. Uh, can be explained uh, quite nicely based on the immediacy of experience principle. If you have to give evidence for everything you say, and that evidence has to be very direct, then you're only going to say short bits, give the evidence, say the next bit, and give the evidence. And, and um, you know, I, I discussed aspects of this in a, in a variety of papers, but uh, that is one of the strongest ways that culture manifests itself in Pitaha grammar, but there's, you really can't find any part of the Pitaha communication or syntax or anything that is not affected by their culture. Hmm. I mean, to, to give people an idea, I'm going to actually read a, a small section from, from your book. And this is a story about, uh, it's, well, the story is called Killing the Panther. And j just to give people a flavor of what it sounds like when when people uh, are speaking in Peter Hunt. So I'm going to read in English, obviously. Uh, so here we go. Here the jaguar pounced upon my dog, killing him. There the jaguar pounced on my dog, killing him. It happened with respect to me. There the jaguar killed the dog by pouncing on it. With respect to it, the jaguar pounced on the dog. I thought I saw it. Then I, thus the panther, pounced on my dog. Then the panther <laughs> pounced on my dog. Then I spoke that this is the work of a panther. Now, it's <laughs> for, 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 you know, for a native English speaker, and I guess for a majority of speakers of major world languages, this is like just painful to read, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, when I, when I record a text from the Pitaha, I play it for other Pitahas to get their commentaries. And very often they'll correct and they'll say, oh, he, he wasn't thinking he should have said this. Uh, but in this one, they all agree, that's a great story. That's a great story. Um, so, so this is like as close to the Pitaha get to uh, literature. And you might, but when you listen to it in Pitaha, it sounds so exciting and, and it's all different suffixes and different, you know, so I'm, I'm sure that my translation doesn't catch quite all the subtleties, but it does catch the basic meaning of what is being said. Basic, you know, it's, um, 
and and uh, well, more than the basic meaning, it captures almost all of it. There's some subtleties in the in the suffixes, but that's pretty much the way it was. Suffixes might indicate whether he was vertical in relation to the observer or something like this, but it's all there. So it's a vivid description for the Pitaha of a life-threatening event because if the jaguar pounces on your dog, you're pretty close by. And then you see your beloved dog and they all love their dogs. This is cultural, you have to know. He was shocked because as he told me outside the story, the dog was, he, he heard the dog yelp and when he got there, the dog was in two pieces, one on each side of a log. So it had been ripped in half. And then he, out the corner of his eye, he saw this black blur, blur and he turned and it was the jaguar, the black panther, jumping straight for him. And, you know, you're talking about 500 pounds of cat coming at you with intent to kill. Everybody knows this when they hear the story. Um, so they like hearing this excitement over and over again. And in short sentences, each of which has the suffix that tells you, I saw this, you know, this is my direct observation. And, and so it's hard to imagine a more vivid, exciting story. We don't use repetition so much in languages in which most of our stories are written because I can just keep going back. How many of us, when we're reading a page, repeat it to ourselves by not saying it to ourselves multiple times, but going back and rereading the paragraph. We didn't quite get it. We didn't quite, get it. well, that's built into Pinaha speech. They don't have to go back and reread. They don't have to stop the tape and rewind. It's just built into the structure. With all the noise going on in the village and all the excitement of this noisy culture where people are running around and laughing all the time, this makes it easier to follow and it makes it more exciting, not less. I think I think there's sort of a bigger question s sitting underneath this, which is, well, you you can translate that 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 Peter Hahn text into English, and I can read it in English. And when I do read it in English, it has, you know, it doesn't seem as exciting to me because it doesn't fit with the way that I would tell a story. But but you could, you know, if you gave that to maybe a, a, a translator who was uh, with a great creative flair, they could sort of take those, those kind of concepts and, and render them into an English that is more what I'm used to. And, and I think the bigger question underneath is, well, if we can translate um, something from one language to another, from any language to another language, then there must be something universal that's, that's sitting there. So does that not mean that there is universal grammar? No, it means that people are by and large intelligent and try hard to understand what they're told. Uh, there's nothing more to it than the fact that, I don't think translation is always possible for one thing. I, I, I don't believe that everything can be translated. So I could have translated that more freely into English so that it, it made more sense to an English speaker. I deliberately did not translate that text so that it sounded natural to English because then you would lose this contrast I was trying to show between the way the Pinaha talk and the way that we talk. But if I give you enough details, you can start to understand that. You may not ever fully understand what it's like to be attacked by a jaguar, which all the Pinaha understand. And, and so they, they get it. You know, so we translate poetry and, and um, you know, my books are translated into other languages and sometimes conscientious translators will ask me, uh, did you mean this or did you mean this? Because it could mean either one. And I talk to them and I have a great idea that they did a good job translating, although I really don't know. I mean, of all the translations of Peter Ha, uh -huh, um, I can't understand most of them. I, I have no idea whether they represented it accurately or not. I mean, um, although I get letters from people, so it seems like they they did understand it. But But can the Bible actually be translated from telling these stories of 2,000-year-old Middle Eastern desert culture into modern-day Amazonian waterlogged uh, rainforest, um, it, it's not clear that it can be. I mean, you can describe things that were happening, but there are so many concepts that lie without, outside of Pitaha culture and Pitaha concepts that lie outside of our culture that um, we can sort of get people to understand the gist of other things. But it was actually through Bible translation. I did translate the Gospel of Mark into Peter Ha, and I knew all the words were right, and I knew the sentences were more or less okay, but they didn't understand any of it. So there are two possible 
explanations. One, my translation, in fact, was no good because I didn't speak the language well enough. Or B, my translation was no good because, you know, it's really not easy to do that. Uh, I mean, you can't. Uh, I think it was a little bit of both. I think what I, it, I used recursion in that translation. I had, I had sentences within sentence. I would put a sentence where a relative clause would go and hope they would interpret as a relative clause. But since they don't build sentences that way, they got lost all the time in what I was trying to do. Uh, but also it's the concept, salvation. You know, what is, what is that? You know, I mean, if I rescue somebody from drowning in Pena High, I wouldn't say I saved him. I would say I pulled him out of the water. They're very specific about things, you know. So I, I got the word, I was looking for the verb smell, but the first thing I got was the, this smells good. I got uh, the, the smoke is pleasant as it hit me, hits me in the nose. Um, you know, so they tend to be quite specific about things and avoid generic uh, verbs. They only have 90 verb roots, as I said. Translation is more or less okay. And the closer the cultures, the better the translation will sound. So if, if you have a bilingual, bicultural person translating, they can make a much better job of it than somebody who's, who's bilingual but not bicultural or bicultural but not bilingual. Um, but that doesn't mean that everything, you know, haiku, we like haiku, poetry in English, but I, I'm almost certain that it hits Japanese native speakers differently than it hits English speakers, no matter how well it's translated. Yeah, um, well, I mean, I know of some specific examples, and a really basic example is if you have a, a poem written in a, in a language which has genders, when you're um, describing a, a tree or the ocean or whatever, you know, you can you can make metaphors about male and female that simply will not exist in English because we don't have gendered adjectives or verbs or, or nouns. So something is lost in, in the process. Yeah, so so there are two things we're trying in poetry we're trying to translate both the form and the meaning, whereas most things we're just trying to translate the meaning. But it's never, I would argue, completely possible to translate it one hundred percent accurately, whether it's form or meaning. Uh, so in that sense, translation, universal translation is really not possible. And if I'm right about Pinaha, that the lessons are more profound. There is no um, psychic unity of man, as Adolf Bastian would have put it. Um, there is a physical, you know, there are physical capacities that are shared for emotions and for cognition. Um, but conceptually, we have very different inventories of concepts. He meant by uh, psychic unity of man that all humans share some sort of universal conceptual grammar, universal set of concepts. Um, and he was very influential and he influenced Boaz uh, as well. Boaz worked for Bastian at the Museum of Ethnography in Berlin. But, um, you know, my, my uh, evidence now is that that doesn't follow. Uh, there's no universal set of concepts other than, yeah, everybody's going to have a going to know what a hand is. If it comes down to the physical in my body, that will be shared. But once you start to move beyond the physical, uh, the universality of those concepts starts to uh, fade off very quickly. Yeah, I, th I think that's something um, which which I've sort of learned myself after, after speaking to you is that we, we don't realize how much we, we gain as, as far as knowledge goes simply by being born in a specific culture. And so, you know, simply by being born, you know, in, in Australia, you know, I've inherited thousands of years of, of Western knowledge and Western culture just immediately. Let, let's take an abstract concept that maybe you would find in the Bible, something like salvation. Um, you know, maybe they don't have that exact, you know, word or, or in, in, in Peter Han, but you could maybe explain it to them, right? Like what it means and... They could either then take that word and adopt it into their language or describe it in a different way? The, the concept of salvation, for example, um, means to save. So it could mean to save someone from drowning. You were my salvation. It could be economic. You, you, you know, that loan was my salvation. It could be soteriological, as we would say in theology. Um, Jesus was my salvation from sin. And once you start to list all of these different things, you ha each one of them, as Peirce would say, we can only interpret one thing in terms of another. 
And then that thing can only be interpreted in terms of another. So it's, it's like an endless chain of what he would call semiotic, semiosis, the, the, the process of meaning. And at some point, those chains simply don't overlap. They're not the same chains. So there's no way to, in Pitaha to go from, um, to connect my need of heaven with I'm drowning. These are, these are not related things. And to try to describe it, I mean, you can, you can make a case for it, but if you think about all the Western cultures, and we all go back to, um, you know, to Christianity. So, so we've had 2,000 years to work these things out, but we still can't agree about things. So the word baptize is, is something that is a huge dis disagreement among many, many Christians. Is baptism uh, sprinkling water on the head? Is it pushing somebody under um, the water? Um, and this could have to do with heaven or hell, depending on your denomination, which where you're going. Um, well, it, you know, if you look at the word baptizo in Koine Greek, um, there's, there are examples like, you know, my, I burned my finger, so I baptized it in the water. I don't think that means sprinkling. Uh, <laughs> probably means to stick it in the water, but there are other counter examples. So even a term that is so central to the Christian experience is baptized, it's not clear that we, we know how to translate that. And there are huge divisions uh, on how to translate that. This actually brings me to, to something which is a question and, and a topic that, that anyone interested in, in, in language, and especially maybe like if you're a linguistic student, you know, it's like you're, you want to sort of understand some basic concepts of, of linguistics. Um, something that is like a mantra which is repeated without evidence really is that um, all languages are equally complex. The second part of that, like piggybacking on that, is, is a popular idea that we have advanced languages you know like like for example english and then we have these primitive languages in the in the jungle the, the interesting thing if if there is a primitive language it's english right it's got you know you take about verbs peter how verbs has sixty five thousand possible forms in, forms english has five sing sang sung singing sings and that's not considering verbs like hit which is basically hit 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 you know i mean there's very little variation there so english uh is the result of having its teeth kicked in by the Romans and the French and dominated for, you know, centuries. And so we used to be German and now we're neither. We're sort of this pigeon tongue. So English is a really simple language. And the fact that we think it's complicated is just a result of the fact that our culture has gotten very complicated. And so the things we talk about and the ways we express, English is a great example of culture affecting syntax. Um, literacy is another great example. As soon as you get people reading and writing their, their language changes. Written language is not spoken language. And that's a great example of culture affecting syntax, which is, is often overlooked. So yeah, the idea that there's simple languages, if I say that all technology is equally complex, people find that to be silly. You know, obviously a plane is more complex than a bow and arrow. Uh, I think language is technology and it fits the needs of the culture. So yeah, the Pinaha don't make airplanes. They make uh, bows and arrows, and those are simpler than airplanes. Nobody should condemn them for not having airplanes, though, because they don't need airplanes. They also don't make golf clubs, which are relatively simple, but they don't need them, and so they don't make them. It wouldn't, there's no place for a golf club in Pinaha culture except to chase down some animal and beat it to death, um, but not to play the game of golf. Um, and so their language fits their culture. So why would it be a problem to say that their language is syntactically simpler than ours? It, it really doesn't make much sense unless you have a vested interest in all languages being the same. You know, I mean, if you think it's racist to say that a language lacks subordinate clauses, um, well, I don't have a good answer for that because that would have never occurred to me that that had anything to do with anything with respect to the ultimate worth of a human being as to whether they use relative clauses. I could say the same thing about size of vocabulary. If I have a vocabulary of 100,000 words and somebody else has a vocabulary of 20,000 words, well, it doesn't mean that I'm, I'm better than that person. The, the writers of the New Testament were none of them, only one of them was a native speaker of Greek, yet they wrote in Greek. And so if you take the apostle John who had a there aren't more than a few hundred words of vocabulary in the Gospel of John, yet it's one of the most beloved works 
of all Western literature because of superstition and stuff like that. But um, it's not because it's a complex document. The words in it are trivial. If, if you were a native speaker of Greek, you would almost consider it uneducated. But that doesn't mean that it's worse or, or anything. Um, so, so the other problem is we don't know how to measure complexity. We can say that the Pinaha syntax is simpler, but is then Pinaha gr grammar overall more complex because of their verbs? Um, there's phonology. They only have um, seven consonants for women and three vowels um, and eight consonants for men and three vowels. There's a very strong cultural difference. Um, does that mean, well, how many letters does a computer use to say anything in the world? In effect, it uses two, zero and one, and it can say anything that needs to be said. So I wouldn't say that computers are communicationally primitive. They're very advanced, yet they use a very primitive language. Well, I mean, that's, that's, that's something that probably, you know, someone sitting at home might think, well, you know, if they've got so few sounds and they can't import certain concepts like for example salvation because because they're constrained by their culture well then you know it's not a complete language right it's not i can't say all the things that i want to say and right yeah uh you can't say all the things you want to say because you're not a pita ha i mean if you give a pita ha two thousand years of exposure to christianity they'll be able to say whatever we want to say about christianity it's not a limitation of the language not even a limitation of the culture it's just I mean, how many of the, the average, English is capable of talking about physics, but the average American is not capable about talk, talking of physics or advanced mathematics. Um, why is that? Is that because English is poor? No, it's because the average person lacks the experience with the concepts of physics to talk about them intelligently. You give someone an education in physics, and if they're you know, halfway intelligent, they will get the words, they'll get the concepts, they'll be able to talk about it. Well, even though they never may be a professional physicist. You know, th this has to do with experience. Holding the pitaha to English standards is, so when I walk with the pitaha in the jungle, they like to hear English because they find it quite funny language, you know, it sounds silly. So they'll say, how do you say this? They'll point to something, how do you say this in your language? I say tree. And then they point to another tree and they say, how do you say this? I said tree and this, tree. You just have one word for all those? Well, some people know more words, but I just know one word. And they said, those are all different words. Those are not the same thing, you know. They're, they're all wood things, but they're not, you know. So they find English, because I'm the exemplar of English, uh, incredibly impoverished. Um, because I don't know the words for anything in the jungle, pretty much. I mean, I can get out a book. I, I take books with me, so I can ask, I can get the vocabulary. But, you know, they'll, they'll tell me something in the jungle. And they say, are you writing this down? No, I forgot my notebook. Oh, well, we'll tell you some other time then, because you'll forget it. You always forget that stuff. <laughs> so they don't have a great, you know, they're not greatly impressed with my mental powers. Um, so, so I wouldn't want to ask them, is Dan a smart guy or a stupid? But they wouldn't think of those categories. Dan's just a guy, you know, he's different than us. You know, he looks different. He smells different. He comes from a different place. Who am I to judge? So they would never occur to them. But they do, they do say English sounds ugly compared to Peter Hahn. That they do say. It, it's funny, but this sort of raises the question in my mind. Is recursion um, basically just a cultural construct? In, in terms of, you know, there's this sort of argument that recursion is, is this evidence that, that a language has, I don't know, evolved, let's just say, to put it simply. But, you know, and, and for example, like, like when I was reading the, 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 the text from the Peter Hahn that you translated, they're very sort of short and simple sentences, which, you know, you would, as a teacher, for example, you associate that with a very low level of, of language ability, because that's how children speak. You know, I want Apple, I like Apple. But, but again, maybe that's just another cultural perspective. Maybe, as you say, they, they find these short, repetitive sentences they actually prefer that. They like that. They don't want recursion. What if I like Apple turned out to be um, the best way to talk in a particular culture? Then everybody would say, I like Apple. Recursion is functionally very useful because it allows you to pack more information into sentences. But if you, but here's the other thing. The Peter Ha can say any, their, their texts, their discourses, their stories 
can be very long, and this, this panther text was very short. And once they're going for quite a while, they do start to get a lot of references back in the text and forward in the text. And, and so they show that they can think recursively by the way they construct their stories, which is a separate topic for discussion. If you can think recursively, does that mean that Chomsky was right, or does that have any relevance to that question whatsoever? But so I, I would say it's probably the case that because we all have the same brain, all humans can think recursively. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have to talk recursively, and it doesn't mean that a language without recursion in sentences can't have it in stories in some way, and it doesn't mean that the language that has it in sentences is somehow superior to the language that only has it in stories. Um, there are a lot of questions that linguists have tended to just throw into one little bundle without sorting them through because we want to believe that very many linguists want to believe that Chomsky took away the mystery and solved the issue. So we just sort these into the right bins and we don't think of all the possible implications of where recursion is found in the grammar or the language, if it's found at all, what's the relationship between our ability to think recursively and our decision not to talk recursively. Um, and, and we know that we do this. I mean, if you're talking to a group of third graders, you're not going to use a great deal of recursion in your sentences because you're making the sentences more complex and you're making the processes of the sentences more complex. Um, you know, if you read Hemingway, you'll probably get um, a different level of recursion than you will if you read... If you read uh, Fifty Shades of Grey. <laughs> yeah, Fifty Shades of Grey, right. You know, so... So people use it uh, use it differently, or you read some uh, philosopher that likes involved sentences. You know some, and 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 you find this too in in Europe. You find that among some cultures in Europe, I won't name cultures, a professor underscores their intelligence by being obscure, um, whereas um, among many philosophers in the U.S., uh, intelligence is shown by clarity of expression and not obscurity of expression. So, you know, a lot of um, Americans, well, many people don't have patience to read Heidegger because he seems to pride himself on obscurity. Uh, Kant does this to some degree. Sartre does this to some degree. Whereas, you know, if you take up an American philosopher like Jerry Fodor or John Searle, who have very different philosophies of language, they're both the epitome of clarity you know where you don't agree with them. There's no discussion of, you know, there's, there's not going to be any book about what did John Searle mean when he said X, because he says it pretty clearly, you know. Um, and whereas there are books that try to figure out what the hell Heidegger was talking about. Well, maybe, um, and, and this is just, um, this is an open question, right? But maybe this uh, ambiguity of, of writing, ambiguity of thought, is, is almost like a defense mechanism, because you can say, well, I didn't really mean that. Ambiguity, there's, there's some good papers out of MIT uh, by Steve Piantadosi and Ted Gibson and some other co-authors that talk about you expect ambiguity in a language. If language evolved for communication, there's always a trade-off between complexity and simplicity of the, of the uh, formal system. And, you know, once you start to trade off, like you get words in English, T-O-O, T-W-O, T-O, those all are pronounced the same. They're homonyms, but they're ambiguous. But they're disambiguated by context. So if I say I want two books, you know that I'm talking T-W-O and not T-O-O or T-O. Um, but uh, so ambiguity is expected. It's also quite useful. You know, you couldn't have politicians if you didn't have ambiguity and vagueness. Um, ambiguity means multiple meanings. Vagueness means no obvious clear meaning. So if I say, yeah, he's here. Um, well, who's he, you know? And, and so, so the whole impeachment debate in the U.S. Congress is based on whether Trump meant what the Democrats think he meant or what the Republicans say he meant. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's fascinating. So one linguist, Steve Pinker, wrote an article in the New York Times analyzing a single word in Trump's conversation that he argues shows that he was, this was quid pro quo. And another linguist, I, I uh, talk to me. He says, well, yeah, so now we're going to impeach a president on the word, use of the word though. Uh, <laughs> so, so you know, ambiguity and vagueness can be very important. If, if Trump had been very clear and said exactly what the Democrats think he said, then he could be impeached. 
And if he were very clear and said exactly what the Republicans think he meant, whatever that is, um, then he couldn't be impeached. But he said it vaguely. And this is how business is conducted. And, you know, I've talked to a lot of people in business who say, well, you, you never say everything in a business deal. You always leave some of the plausible deniability in there, you know. Uh, and language permits that, fortunately. Yeah, it's. I think. I think my my favorite example of how ambiguity uh, ambiguity can depend on, on on language is um like if I if I'm if I'm you know if we're talking in English and I say to you, ah um my neighbor came over for a drink last night right that's ambigu that's ambiguous because I don't have to specify the gender, but if I'm speaking in Spanish you know I have to choose am I saying you know the the male neighbor or the female neighbor which which gives more information which, which in, in an obligatory way, right? You get more information that, that's, not, that's out of my control because of my language. But, but you still, it makes it easier to lie because if it was a female neighbor, you can use the male gender with your wife. <laughs> <laughs> which, which would be a great, which would be a necessary. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, you know, even the fact that the Pinaha have these suffixes that say where you got the evidence, all you have to do is lie and you use the one that said, I saw it directly. When in fact you didn't, and do the Peter Ha lie? Oh yeah, they do lie. <laughs> so, so lying is uh, we could say a, a universal aspect of, of humanity. Yeah, wanting people, you know, even we could say it goes beyond humans. You know, we know we know birds and monkeys that give alarm calls when there's no alarm around because all the other birds and monkeys will leave them with the food by themselves. Uh, <laughs> so, to me, that's lying outside of the human uh, species. Just just to finish off episode two, because, you know, we've we've talked a lot about, you know, the Peter Hunt culture and how that relates to language um, and, and also, you know, what that tells us about the relationship between language and culture. You know, what, what is the sort of main thing that you want people to really take away from today's episode? I want people to think of languages as unique repositories of aggregated information that have resulted from thousands of years and at least hundreds of years of individual experiences of particular languages. In other words, each language is unique and we have to understand it in its uniqueness before we can make any sense of talking about its similarities to other languages. So bringing a theory to languages that says they're all alike in aspect A is to me the least helpful way of doing research. First I discover it, I, I, I describe it, and then I see if there's any similarities that, that really make a lot of sense to me.